our third speaker in this session this morning, again focusing at the farm level. So we've got some subsequent sessions talking about the agribusiness sector and, uh, and beyond the farm gate, but this one is very much focused at the farm level. And uh, our third speaker is David Sackett, whom I'm sure a lot of people in the audience would know. Uh, David was the founding partner of Home Sackett, or one of the founding partners of Home Sackett and Associates. Uh, an agricultural consultancy firm based in southern New South Wales and he was involved in that business for over 20 years as it developed into a leading agricultural consultancy business in southeastern Australia. He was also a board member of the Sheep Cooperative Research Centre and Prattley Livestock Equipment. He currently sits on a number of company boards related to agriculture including the Future Farm Industries Cooperative Research Centre TA Fields Estates, a corporate farming business, and Warringa Group Enterprise Limited. He is Managing Director of Growth Farms, responsible for business management, growth, strategic planning, finance, risk management, and governments within that organisation. As an industry leader, David has extensive understanding of agriculture and is in demand as a speaker both locally and internationally, so we're very fortunate that he is able to, to come today and he's going to talk about the performance of the corporate farm sector in Australia. So please welcome David Sackett. Thanks Mick, that didn't sound like me at all. <laughs> I'm glad that was made up. Um, <clears throat> I really want to uh, have a bit of a look at corporate agriculture and some of it will be opinion and some will be fact. So we've had two very much fact-based presentations and I'm going to have a bit more speculation I suppose. And really what I want to do is have a look at the landscape of corporate agriculture and think about what it is and, and um, the features of it. And then I want to have a look at the track record of corporate ag and, uh, and maybe some, make some comments about that track record and then some thoughts about the future of corporate agriculture. So I, th I think firstly it's worth actually thinking what do we mean by corporate ag and the simplistic definition is they operate as a company operating entity as a company, which I think is a bit of a nonsense. And really I think corporate agriculture, as we all perceive it, is really about agriculture where the capital is separated, the capital is provided from a different party to those who are operating. There might be a bit of overlap in the capital, but essentially the capital is coming from one source and operational expertise or implementation is coming from another source. And I think that's how we perceive it and that's how we should continue to think about it, not the fact that whether you're operating as a sole trader partner or, or, um, or a company, because that, that structure is basically irrelevant to performance of agriculture. I think we've got, we've got a range of models that uh, currently occur and I think these models continue to evolve. We've got listed versus unlisted, so we have I think three or four agricultural companies that are listed um, and I'm not talking about agribusiness or processing or anything down the track, I'm talking about businesses that, that operate predominantly in the business of farming. Um, so we've got listed and unlisted, we've got retail and wholesale, the majority of funds in corporate agriculture I, was, I would describe as being wholesale and private rather than at the retail level where mum and dad write out a cheque out of their super fund for 10 grand and put it in um, we have direct investment and we have investment via funds and that mix is changing I think at the moment which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, when I mean direct they go essentially the entity buys the land and whether it operates or leases or whatever but, but it owns the land directly. When we talk about a fund it's, it's a group of people investing into an entity and that entity then goes and buys a range of farms. <coughs> Co-mingled money, if you like. We've got operators and we've got people who buy the land and lease it to other operators. To so there's a couple of different models there. And we also see a few wholly owned versus joint venture type arrangements. And again, I'll sort of touch on these a little bit more as we go. I think it's important that we look at the motivations. Why are these people investing in agriculture? And I think there's a whole range of reasons. And for a lot of them, a lot of the corporates, it, it is supposedly financial. But I don't think it's always financial and not exclusively financial. So they're often looking for returns. 
At the moment, there's a lot of interest because they see it as a natural, in, natural hedge against inflation, which there's a lot of concern about as we've had money being pumped into the economy, global economy. And they see it as an alternative asset that's got low correlation with equities. So they see it's part of a portfolio. There are people motivated by food security or investors motivated by food security. They see it as relatively low risk in agriculture. And, and that might seem a little contradictory to some of what we see with volatility. But if, if you think about it in a couple of contexts, one is in most broad acre businesses, about 80% of the value of the investments in the land. And, that, and so it will preserve the capital successfully and will generate some capital growth, as we say. So it's low risk from that point of view. Sure, you've got volatility in, in your operating return, but the underlying capital is not at risk compared to derivatives or compared to equities or compared to private equity, which can disappear very rapidly. Some invest for marketing reasons, so they, they want to have a brand and they want to see that they've got some sort of connection to the production end. And that's particularly something that's more common coming out of China, where they want to, branding it clean and green and everything else is really important. And they want to stick a photo on the label which shows the farms that some of the milk is coming from or some of the beef is coming from. And then the last one is, uh, and I don't think we should underestimate this, is uh, a lot of people seem to be motivated by romance, ego, um, emotion, the size of a hat they can wear, the fact that they can put a map of their station over Belgium and you can't see Belgium underneath, and all those sorts of things. I think, I, I don't think we should underestimate those, though most people probably wouldn't admit that that's their motivation. I think what are the, it's important really to think about what the advantages that corporate agriculture might be able to bring. And I think it's just two things, quite simply. One is access to capital. So we've been talking about, Rose mentioned the issue around farmers getting access to finance. And, things. And, and corporates tend to have very good access to capital. They come with, with what are, by our standards, pretty large checks in a lot of cases. That, that is great as long as they're using that capital wisely. The other thing that they've got is access to expertise, and I think that's a couple of levels. Um, I think that the size of the business sometimes allows specialisation. So you can employ someone who's very good at marketing if you want to, some, even though it only makes two bucks a ton difference, or maybe that's random anyway. Um, you, you can uh, employ people who are specialists at bookkeeping, accounting, and specialists in operation areas. So, Compared to the family farm model, you've got a lot of scope for people to particular to develop a niche and do that really well. You've also got outside expertise from agriculture, and, and my observation of that would be that it's uh, a very mixed quality. And sometimes add value, adds value, but uh, all too often detracts from value. So I, I think they're the simple advantages that corporates have. And I guess the question is, how good are they at taking those advantages and turning them into good returns for their clients or for their investors? To help answer that, I've actually, with the help of Pit Capital, is looked at the track record of corporate agriculture. And it's hopeless, what we have to say as a group. So taking, taking these nine entities which, for which I could get information, some of them listed, some of them unlisted, commencing 1st of January 2000 or whenever the entity started, and looking at total investor returns per annum, net of fees, expenses, etc. And some, some are listed, some are not, some are funds, there's a range of things in there. Um, I'm deliberately not going to identify them and you can all speculate about who they are. Um, the only one I will identify is uh, the one that has an operating return but no capital growth component to give a total investor return and that's uh, Growth Farms, the company I'm involved with. But if we look at that performance, we go from about uh, minus 5% per annum 
Um, the, the best performance is plus 20, which is outstanding. But unfortunately, there's a lot more negatives there than there are positives. So most corporate agriculture has managed to destroy wealth. It's pretty simple. Why have they done that? There's a whole heap of reasons. I think, to be fair about some of these numbers, some of them might have only been operating for a relatively short period. And we saw the, the capital growth data that, that has gone up earlier. And, and we haven't had a lot of capital growth in the last five or six years. So if you haven't had, haven't had a lot of capital growth, your returns are going to be constrained simply because that's an important part of the return over the long term. So, so I, I don't blame Australian institutions for sitting on the sidelines and not writing out checks for agriculture. Because they look at the, I mean, they look at those sort of performances. And why would you invest? Would you put your money into those? And I would have to say that I'd be very careful about putting my money into those. Because our track record is not good. But part of the other issue is the lack of transparency. So I could trawl around getting those numbers. There is no transparency of the performance of corporate agriculture. You can get the list of entities relatively easily. But a lot of the other stuff, you just can't get access to the numbers. And so while investors sit there with their checkbooks and say, well, should I invest in this sector or not? One of their questions is, what's the track record? Where's the performance data? We don't have it. And if we don't have it, then they're not going to invest. I think as part of the question about why is this performance pretty ordinary, I think we look at the fundamentals of what makes an investment work, and I think it's really two things, not just in agriculture, but across any business. You've got to buy well, is the first thing, and you've got to manage well. What does buying well mean? It means basically buying a discount market, quality asset that's for whatever reason is is um, under market value. I think a lot of the corporates, if you look at what's happened, they actually go and buy over market value for a range of reasons. And we've seen them. We've seen them pay a 30% premium to go and buy properties when they start a fund or they get going. Pay a 30% premium, you automatically kill your operating return. And effectively, if capital growth is 6 to 8% per annum, you've wiped out five years of capital growth. You are never going to make it up. And they say, oh, well, you know, the rising tide lifts all the boats. Sure. But you've blown the first 30% of capital growth. And, and we see that so often, that people are paying too much for assets. There's one, I would say, one entity that uh, had quite a significant investment in irrigated agriculture and most of their assets were concentrated in, in uh, the part of the irrigation areas that had the highest value of water per megalitre. So automatically the returns are going to be compromised because they are paying over the odds for the assets. The second component is to manage well. And I think the, the challenge is how do, how do corporates manage as well as the successful farming businesses that, that Graham was talking about. Small differences make a big difference to profit. There's no doubt about that. And so you've got to have the culture that is focused on the small differences, both on the income side and the expense side. No different to what Graham explained it very clearly. You've got to manage well. Now you notice there I haven't put up, uh, you've got to exit well. Because I think largely that's a secondary consideration. If you buy well and you manage well, the rest of it looks after itself. I'm sure you've got to try and get the timing right and you've got to maximise the price at the time. But the market when you sell is largely out of your control. It's about getting in at the right time and then or at the right asset and then doing it well. So if we look at the successful family farms, I think they have a couple a, a number of attributes. And we'll we'll compare these with the corporates. They have a very long-term view, often multi-generational. Um, corporates, usually outside capital, the long-term view for them is 10 years. 
and that is a major impediment to performance. I think over time, when capital growth is lumpy, and so if you if you come into WA agriculture in 2007, 8, just when it hit that peak, you probably would have seen no cap, very little capital growth subsequently. And so there they are, the investors are sitting there saying, well, you said you're going to give me 6 or 8% capital growth, you give me nothing. But sometime in the next three, five, eight years, we'll probably see another strong run in capital growth. So you've got to be there for the long haul. And 10 years is not the long haul in agriculture. It's nowhere near long enough to capture those, those uh, spikes in capital growth. You might get one, you might not. You just don't know when you're going in. The family farms are flexible, adaptable and responsive. So, you know, they, uh, when they wake up in the morning and have a shave, they talk to the boss and then they go and do the work. And, sorry, there's, there are women who... I'm not saying all women shave, <laughs> but you know what I mean. <laughs> um, so, so they're flexible and adaptable. They can make decisions quickly and easily. They don't have a corporate structure to go through. They don't have to get approvals. They don't have to go and get additional funds. It's a flat management structure and it can respond and they're accountable for the decisions that they make today at this harvest. And they're lean and mean. And, um, you know, they come from a culture of lean and mean. Farmers are not very good at getting out the checkbook. And you've got to have that attitude in agriculture because it's a low margin business. You've got to have very good cost control. And a lot of the corporates that come in don't have that culture of good cost control. So why are we seeing such variability and such, I would say, poor performance from the corporate sector? Um, I think we have an overemphasis on size in terms of corporate investments. So certainly the, the ABS data and things show that the larger the farm, the more profitable the farm. But that's including all these very small ones. And if you looked at that, that data that Count put up, when you get up into the larger scale farms, except horticulture, it actually starts to flatten fairly quickly. The difference in performance between a very large farm and, and a moderate sized farm is actually quite small. And I actually think from some of the data that, you know, when we were benchmarking, is that there's actually some evidence of diseconomies of scale in agriculture at a very large end. And, and uh, so being very large, I thought at times, was actually a licence to lose more money, not a licence to make, make it. And, and it's interesting as to why that happens. But I think if we're talking about reasonable size farming businesses, say investing from five to seven, eight million dollars up to probably 20, 30, 40 million dollars in a farm business, you look at the return profile from those and they're actually quite flat. But, it, uh, but the corporates, from my observation, tend to get very obsessed with our large farms. I don't know whether it's something to do with the fact that they're middle-aged men and what it is, and they want something big, but it, it really is misplaced. And, and the evidence does not support it. And, and with the focus on very large scale and the risk of diseconomies, there's a number of issues that happen. How do you place the capital? If you say my average farm investment is going to be 20 or 30 million dollars, how many opportunities come up every year to buy a farm that's worth 20 or 30 million dollars? Very few. And therefore, your opportunities to buy well, one of the key criteria for good investment performance, you're automatically tied one hand behind your back. And so if we didn't have this obsession about size, because at the end of the day, the cost reductions that you get from very large agriculture compared to moderate sized agriculture are insignificant. And it's about generating income, not about cost control. And so they're focused on the wrong issue, I think. They're focused on getting getting large assets, and what that does when you have very large assets is that you get portfolio concentration, and that brings portfolio risk, and that brings portfolio volatility, and that means investors get scared because you have bad years, and when it goes bad on this patch, it's gone bad in your whole portfolio. And so the lack of diversity in the portfolio by this obsession of large-scale farms actually introduces substantial portfolio risk into the investment. 
So I think we, we need to rethink that and rethink how we invest and how we deploy the capital. So, so this obsession with size I think we have to get over because you know, the data that Karen put up is not linear. It does not keep getting more and more profitable as you get bigger and bigger. But the only advantage that scale gives you, as far as I can see, is if you've got a whole heap of fixed costs with your office in the city and all your fancy people that get paid a lot of money and drive flash cars, you spread those over more hectares. Sure. So the motivation about scale is more about spreading fixed costs of the corporate, the corporate costs, the corporate overheads over more hectares, than it is about farm level efficiency. So it's completely the wrong motivation about scale. And, and you add to that the risk of, of portfolio concentration. I think it's, it's a problem that we have. Now I'm not saying we should go to small farms. I'm not saying that we should be all, the corporate should be in $40,000 value turnover fund. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying we just need to think carefully out the other end. I, I think um, um, one of the key areas of poor performance of corporates is, I was actually going to call this slide, um, the Goldman Sachs slide, but I thought it might be a bit inappropriate. I can say it, but, but I think often we have very poor alignment between managers and investors. The manager's remuneration is very much aligned to base fees and assets under management. So if, if you get one, two, or one and a half, or in some cases 2.7% um, management fee, your value of assets, what's your motivation? Your motivation is to get as many assets under management as possible. Your performance component, maybe it comes five years, ten years down the track. And so there's this, I think, a misalignment between, between the managers and the investors. I think a fee structures are not appropriate in a lot of cases. So. If we look typically at agriculture, 4 to 6% EBIT is what we can expect long term broad acre agriculture, 6 to 8% capital growth. You cannot go in and charge 2.5% when you've got an EBIT of 4 or 5% and expect the asset to perform. And yet that's the culture that we've inherited from the investment banking community of 2 over 20 what, 2% fees, 20% of the profit. And it is just not appropriate for agriculture. We need different models. And, and, we, and so we brought, the, we just transplanted this from, from other investment sectors, particularly pre-GFC, and we've applied it to agriculture without, and it really never has a hope of return, of generating returns for the clients. Um, I think the other key issue is that in, in a number of entities we see assets being rolled in at market, at market value. Um, that's great. But what's the key, one of the key criteria about making an investment perform? Buying well. And if you're rolling them in at market value, then you've already, I mean, we tried to buy for 10 to 20% 10 to below market value. Because that's, you immediately get some increased value in your assets. So if you can do that, you're much better off than rolling them in at market value. Because immediately you've foregone 10 to 20 percent of capital appreciation, and then there's the issue, of course, is what is the market value? So I think there are too many, there are conflicts and there's poor alignment, but there's opportunities to fix those things. I don't think there's a, a problem. I think we just need, to, I, I think between the expertise that we have in agriculture and the expertise that uh, that we have in uh, in the investment community, we can actually do these things much better. One of the other reasons, which I've already touched on, is um, is time frames are too short. Year to year variability, capital growth, and the key issue about deploying large amounts of capital. So I remember when um, Terra Firma bought um, Consolidated Pastoral, and uh, I met the bloke who'd done the deal, and uh, and he said, "Oh, 400 million." You know, that really is a pretty small deal for us. It's barely worthwhile getting out of bed for it. And, and they come in with these large checks because they've got a portfolio which is so large, they don't want it sort of scattered thinly over everything. So they want to deploy these large lumps of money very quickly. 
Interestingly, he said he was aiming for 25% return on capital with 50% 50, 50 leverage. Um, I wonder how it looks today. So, so I think we, you know, we need investors to be thinking longer term. And there's plenty of patient capital out there. What it is, that we, we don't have patient managers of that capital because they want to compare their performance to the last three months or whatever it is, because their bonus is, is done in the next 12 months. So there is the patient capital, and we have to educate the investment community that 10 years is an absolute minimum if you really want to go in and give yourself a good chance in corporate agriculture. You know, I think there's something like 8 billion years that the sun's going to blow up. That's a long time frame. That's a seriously long time frame. 10 years is not a long time frame. But for the investment community, anything past three is a long time frame. And that's a real problem for us when we're trying to attract capital. I think there's another issue of why we don't perform as well as we should. And I think it's a tendency to get a bit starry-eyed about a new opportunity, whip up a spreadsheet, put the prices in, put the yield in, which might be at the slightly high end of the range, and uh, wax lyrical about creating a new market opportunity for a new product. And how does it all pan out over the next eight or ten years? You know, I, I think the patient capital we should be focusing on proven low risk sectors as a general rule. There is enough volatility and variability in Australian agriculture to bring some excitement. We don't need to add, it, add to it by bringing in an unproven or high risk enterprise. So, you know, because I read something the other day that there's a proposal in Northern Australia to grow, I can't remember, it was 50,000 or 25,000 hectares of guar. And produce wire gum. I don't know, I hope they know more about it than I do. But the point is that, you know, that's a major investment in a crop. I don't, who knows what wire is? I don't, but but should, we, should we be taking institutional money into those sort of things that I think are high risk? And I just think it is setting us up to fail. <coughs> so, having thought about all those issues, I, I think. What do we think? What's the future going to look like in the in the corporate world? I think the thematic of food is uh, widely accepted. Uh, I think uh, over the next 5, 10, 20 years, quite likely we will see a huge amount of money from institutions, from high net worths, whatever, moving into agriculture. It has become a mantra about food shortages, about water shortages, about all those sort of things. I'm not so convinced, to be quite honest, and that might be in my interest to say that, but I think agriculture has shown a fantastic ability to respond to supply shortages, particularly when you double the price. Farmers can be very, very innovative and very responsive. So we may see that. Certainly if you look over the last uh, 10 years, we have seen increases in soft commodity prices globally. So maybe we are seeing an increase in prices. But I, my view is that we can't rely on that increase to make the investment work. The investment has to work at current commodity prices, or as in five year historicals or something like that. If you're relying on a major increase in beef or wheat or cotton or tomatoes, whatever it is, to make the investment work, then I think we're setting ourselves up to fail. It must work at current prices. And then you've at least got a good chance of making it happen. I think the capital is really mobile. And it's hard to appreciate it as we sit here. But you know, investors sit in other parts of the world and they say, mm, yeah, look, you know, we talk to them about managing assets in agriculture. And they say, look, yeah, Australia's interesting, yeah, but what we really want is someone who can manage a global agricultural portfolio for us. You think, oh, it's hard enough in Australia, let alone trying to get a handle on managing agriculture in, in Europe or in North America or other places like that. The, the capital is, has a very much a global view, so we have to maintain competitive advantages at the farm level and through to the port and further down the track. It's no good us being very, very efficient at the farm level if, if our low cost of production at the farm level translate to high cost at port. And I think we have some issues around that. 
if, if those people look at where they're going to place money, if those institutions, which tend to be reasonably conservative, they, they really have a pretty short list of where they're going to place the money without the risk of burning it up, a la Ukraine. And that list really is Australia, New Zealand, North America, and maybe, maybe Europe. So we are really well positioned to capture, capture because what they don't want, like in, in uh, Poland at the moment, you can't actually, they've invested and got fantastic returns, but they can't actually get the capital back out because the government's changing the rules around land ownership. And that's the last thing they want to do. So there are very few destinations that meet a lot of the criteria of these, this uh, institutional or largest, larger sources of capital. And we are favoured as one of those. We, gener we actually generate returns without subsidies. And they're quite amazed at the fact that we can do 4 to 6% even without a subsidy in there. Because in Europe, they do 1% with a subsidy. And so they actually find it quite exciting that the government can't actually change the rules around the subsidies and undermine the last little bit of profit that you actually had. So there's a lot of attractive things about Australia. I think if we think about where is the capital going to come from, who are the people, what are the entities, I, I think there's, there are high net worth individuals who certainly show an interest in agriculture and they're quite capable of putting reasonable amounts of money in. There are family offices, and family office just means family somewhere that made enough money that they need to set up an office to put some people in there to manage the money because they've got so much of it they can't do it themselves. And, and family offices, I think, are a really good source of capital because they are patient, they're nimble, and, and they have a very long-term view. Because often the family has, money, has made the money over the last two or three generations or something like that. So I, I think we see interest from those people and I think they have a real competitive advantage in terms of the way their attitude to invest in capital. I think institutionally there's a huge amount of money and, and increasingly these people are saying, well, we need to put some of our portfolio into hard assets, which is where ag seems to fit. How much we put in? Maybe 1%. But 1% of the amount is a huge amount of money. And if Australia attracts a small proportion of that, there'll be a huge amount of money flowing into the country, into agriculture. I think it'll come slowly. Australian institutions are probably on the uh, tail end of the wave. And I, and I often ask why, but I think uh, partly is our track record. I think a lot of them have actually put their toe in the water and had their toe cut off. So they don't want to put the rest of their toes in. Quite understandable. I think they'll probably come in just as the boat's sort of starting to recede. Um, I, I think we will see a diversity of models. Um, I think the, the larger institutions, from my experience, are showing more and more interest in going direct. If they've got a hundred million or more maybe even 50 million or more, they're more interested in going in on their own account rather than going through a fund where they get all these sort of rules, they've got compliance costs, they're investing with other parties, and a lot of them got burnt in their funds in the, in the GFC. And so now some of those people are saying, don't want to do that, I want to have control. I want to have complete control, I'll go direct. I've got enough grunt to go in there and build a decent portfolio on my own. I think more in the 20, 30, 50 million dollar range will see interest in those smaller groups putting money into funds because it's hard for them to go to rent and get a good portfolio diversity and get scale. I think we're seeing a range of models and I think the interesting thing is that uh, a lot of, well, there is certainly in our business we're seeing more and more people who are interested in buying the land but not taking any operational risk. I think it's a pretty smart model for a lot of them. One, because leases are overpriced and, and you can generate a lease for 4%, 5% return on capital. I don't know how the people pay it, but they seem to for at least a couple of years. They pay 4 or 5% return on capital. Then even from operating gives you, gives you 4 to 6. So you can lease for about the same return or just on the lower end of the range in which you can operate. So why would you take the operational risk? I think part of the reason you take the operational risk is that you've got control over your capital growth component of your business, whereas leasing is misalignment between the lessee and the landowner. 
I think we need to lift the knowledge of both the, both the agricultural investment communities. They sort of sit way over here and way over here. I actually think agriculture has the skills and expertise uh, to learn from investment banking. I think that's a much easier task than trying to educate investment banking about agriculture, to be quite honest, but from my experience. There are some exceptions in amongst that, but, but gee whiz, there's not enough exceptions. Um, so I think, you know, as, a, as people who are involved in agriculture, we really have an obligation to understand how these people think, how they operate and what the key issues are, and there's a whole new language and everything else out there that all is a bit daunting. I think the other thing we need, obviously, is better performance, and part of that is better transparency. And uh, at the moment, for instance, all investors, they can look up the All Ordinaries Index, they can look up a Commercial Property Index, they, they can't look up an egg or a farmland index. And so some transparency and performance would be really good, and maybe Frank, are you going to talk about that later? Yeah, so I won't say any more about it, but on the other hand, the other side of me says, well, actually, do we really want better transparency when you look at the track record that's out there? It might be a bit scary. Um, so, so I think that, you know, as a sector, it's not going to replace family farms. But I think the challenge for the sector is to emulate the best characteristics of the family farms and add to that the advantages of the corporate spread. And, and that's where the real opportunity is. At the moment, the cost of being a corporate is not translating through increased benefits and increased returns to the investor. So the corporate structure in a lot of entities is actually detracting from the investment. And it needs to think more about those characteristics of successful family farm businesses implement those and then I think there's a great future for corporate agriculture because the money I'm sure over the next 10 years or so is going to come.